good morning sir and a good morning to all distinguished uh, faculty my name is shailendra shivasto and today uh, i am representing shilpa medical limited on behalf of uh, the mumbai hematology group and grateful to dr mb agarwal for giving us this great opportunity of uh, participating on this forum uh, sincere regards to dr rajesh kashyap and a sincere regards to dr abhay bhave also a small glimpse about what we are we are a leading niche pharmaceutical company established in 1987 and listed on the bsc 1995 and nsc in 2009 and we are proud to contribute around 40% of the world's oncology specific apis we are the company who have got the highest number of accreditations in our favor and we have got us fda approvals we have got european gmp certificate approved with us and we have got invisa brazil we have got cofepris maxco with us canadian regulatory approvals and then we have got the australian regulatory approvals and we have our operations in entire us and uk market we are proud that we are the first indian company who introduced orally disintegrated strips in the indian market and we market the same in the european and us countries also we have got the uh, ondansetron 4 mg 8 mg especially for the chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting and we have got the procal shield the uh, drug of choice especially for the constipation related with chemotherapy and a large basket of uh, hematology product portfolio we have as a citadine as a shield we have got imatinib dasertinib and venda shield bendamustine and recently introduced busulfan especially for the allogenic stem cell transplant with yushin we are proud that we are going to introduce what is omeb in multi dose vial 3.5 mg which can be used in the multi doses and many more therapies to come and the recent introduction from shilpa medical limited is a revolution in the treatment of colorectal cancer and then metastatic breast cancer with the introduction of capacitamine dispersible tablet form in 1 gram so far the therapy is available in 500 mg and we have introduced last week only a 1 gram tablet of dispersible so from 7 to 8 tablets in a day there is no need of taking any tablet just drop the tablet in 100 ml water get it dissolve and drink that has been one of the revolution which has been introduced by shipa medical limited many more to come with the support of you all and i'm really delighted to hand over this session to agarwal sir thank you so much sir thank you mr shrivastava for the welcome note and uh, supporting our academic activity good morning to one and all today our guest speakers are dr radhika banka from mumbai she will be speaking on dovax for treating pulmonary thromboembolism this will be followed by the second guest lecture dr abhay bhave from mumbai and he will be speaking on unusual site thrombosis to treat as usual or not these webinars are brought to you by mumbai hematology group this one is supported by shilpa and managed by perfect square i thank mr rajiv saxena mr shailendra srivastava and the team from shilpa medicare mr yash kalpesh and the team from perfect square executive committee of mumbai hematology group our chief guest today dr rajesh kashyap from lucknow our guest speakers dr radhika banka and dr abhay bhave from mumbai all our discussants who are themselves eminent physicians chest physicians vascular surgeons or hematologists you participants for sparing your sunday morning that's the website of mumbai hematology group there is no password you can visit it to see our future academic activities www.mhgindia.com next weekend saturday 7 pm we have dr prashant sharma from pgi chandigarh speaking to us on thalassemia and next sunday morning dr ritu jain from jaslok and hn reliance foundation hospital speaking to us on bone marrow transplants in the era of cart therapy our discussants today are very important people and they have been displayed here alphabetically briefly to introduce them we have dr akshaya from kolkata dr anil singh from imphal dr anupama from london dr ashutosh from bhubaneswar dr vijita from kolkata dr karuna kumar from sikandarabad Dr Kunal Goel from Varanasi Dr Mahadeva Swami from Goa Dr Mopoli Ghosh from Kolkata Dr Nakul Tikare from Bhubaneswar Dr Sunit Lokwani from Indore Dr Vikas Goel from Raipur 
It's my pleasure to introduce my friend and today's chief guest, Dr. Rajesh Kashyap. Dr. Rajesh Kashyap is professor in the Department of Hematology at the prestigious Sanjay Gandhi Institute of Medical Sciences, Lucknow. I request him to inaugurate our today's webinar and give some words of wisdom for all of us. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir, for your kind introduction. It's, a, it's an honor to be on your uh, program uh, today. And uh, we have two uh, very beautiful topics to be discussed. One is on pulmonary embolisms, treatment with uh, DOAX, direct oral anticoagulants, and other is unusual site of thrombosis. So as a hematologist, uh, both of the areas are of my interest personally. And uh, in my whole experience, which I've seen as unusual site of thrombosis is more quite frequent in patients with underlying malignancies, either solid tumors or hematological malignancies as myeloproliferative disorders. And uh, another aspect that I noticed was uh, uh, those patients who have uh, long drawn uh, a central venous line, and they are at a higher incidence of having upper limb thrombosis, a DVT. So management of this uh, conditions, as we still do not have a standard, well-defined guidelines, though clinical experience are vast, and I uh, presume uh, Dr. Bhavi will be throwing light on this aspect uh, very much. And another interesting article that I was recently reading was seasonal variation in uh, pulmonary embolism. This is from the French group. And uh, after all, over a period of time, they studied and found that pulmonary embolism is more common in winter. So that's uh, got to do with what we studied in pathologies, the FERCOS triad, uh, stasis, the rheology of blood, initiation of hypercoagulable state. And uh, well, this may not be a problem much in a country like ours in India but especially in the colder parts uh, in the northern part of India, Kashmir and above. Uh, probably if one would have to do an epidemiological study, we would find that uh, VT is more common in uh, winter months. So I look forward and, uh, to both of my speakers today to be throwing light on these two aspects, the pulmonary embolism and unusual sites of thrombosis. And uh, I hand over back to Dr. Agarwal for conducting the further session. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Professor Rajesh Kashyap, for those kind words and sparing your valuable time to inaugurate our today's webinar. We are really blessed. Our next activity is to talk about the Sunday quiz. That's for everybody. Each or one of you can participate. So we will give you a case profile and show you some pictures of skin lesions. You have to diagnose the skin lesion and email the number of the correct answer to mbagarwal1 at gmail.com. Just the number, not the full sentence. You have to save time because the winner will be fastest finger first. And of course, we are going to speak out the names of all those who send in the correct entry. So this is the case profile and on the right side, you see the clinical picture. 64 year old woman having Waldenstrom macroglobulinemia needing treatment. She received four cycles of bendamustin rituximab and she presented with certain skin findings as you see on the right side. There was no involvement of mucosa there was no history or evidence of insect bite. Detailed workup for viral infection and autoimmune disorders was negative. A punch biopsy showed perivascular and interstitial eosinophilic infiltrate. The question is, what is your diagnosis? And we'll give you eight options. There'll be a number to each option and whichever you feel is the correct option, correct diagnosis, that number you have to email. Before that, I show you some pictures. This is the one which you just saw, and that's on the back of the thigh. This is after three weeks of the treatment, and that's also after three weeks of the treatment. These are the eight options given to you, and you have to email the number one, two, three, up to eight 
to mbagarwal1 at gmail.com. One, this is skin infiltration by Waldenstrom. Two, this is amyloidosis secondary to Waldenstrom. Three, this is sweet syndrome. Four, this is bendamustine skin toxicity. Five, this is rituximab skin toxicity. Six, this is a primary autoimmune skin disorder, nothing to do with Waldenstrom. Seven, this is a paraneoplastic skin lesion. And eight, none of the above. So I'll keep this slide on for a few seconds. Whichever you feel is the correct or the closest answer, number of that is to be emailed to mbagarwal1 at gmail.com. Okay, so pick up the best possibility and email its number to mbagarwal1 at gmail.com. Winner will be fastest finger first. And between the two lectures, somewhere we will tell you the correct answer and the winner's name. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our first guest speaker, Dr. Radhika Banka. She's consultant, respiratory physician, MBBS, DNB Respiratory Medicine, MRCP UK, Fellow Plural Medicine, Oxford Plural Unit, Oxford, UK. She's consultant at the PD Hinduja Hospital Medical Research Center, Mahim, Mumbai. After completing her postgraduate residency training in PD Hinduja in 2016, she moved to UK, where she worked at the Norfolk and Norwich University Hospitals, followed by the Oxford Plural Unit, Oxford University Hospital, UK and then relocated back to India. During her stint in UK, she gained immense experience in multidisciplinary management of common respiratory illnesses, including asthma, COPD, interstitial lung diseases, pneumonia, lung cancer, pulmonary thromboembolism, and tuberculosis. She has sub-specialized in the field of plural diseases and has gained skills in thoracic ultrasound and has been certified with level two Royal College of Radiology Thoracic Ultrasound Competence. She has been invited as a faculty for plural courses at the British Thoracic Society and European Respiratory Society conferences. She has over 20 PubMed index publications, three book chapters and one book to her name. She has received sponsorships from the Indian Chess Society and European Respiratory Society to present her work at various international national forums. Today, she's going to lecture us on DOEX for treating pulmonary thromboembolism. Over to Dr. Radhika. Oh, thank you, sir, for the very kind introduction. Uh, so I'm just gonna share my screen. Right, okay. So that's visible, right, sir? The slide is visible. Your video is off, I think. Oh, okay. So Yeah, now we can see. So uh, at the outset, I would like to thank uh, the Mumbai Hematology Group and Dr. M. B. Agarwal, sir, for really giving me this opportunity uh, to talk to you about uh, direct oral anticoagulants for treating pulmonary thromboembolism. So it's a fairly large topic. So uh, I've divided my talk into a few subcategories. So we'll talk a little bit about pharmacology, clinical evidence of using these medications in uh, acute venous thromboembolism, use of in extended anticoagulation, certain practical considerations and use in special situations such as cancer. So let's move on to our first section of pharmacology. So uh, just to tell you a little bit about the history of anticoagulation. So the first medications that were detected for uh, VTE were the parenteral unfractionated heparins in the early 1900s. 
uh, and this was revolutionized later by the development of the oral uh, vitamin K antagonist warfarin in the late uh, in around 1940s and this was the first oral medication for anticoagulation and then there were subsequently a lot of developments of various parenteral agents such as low molecular weight heparin direct factor 2a direct indirect factor 10 inhibitors until the early 2000s when again we had uh, newer oral treatments with either direct factor 2 inhibitors or the direct factor 10 inhibitors uh, which we are going to discuss today so uh, the noax also known as the newer oral anticoagulants or the doax which are the direct oral anticoagulants but for how long is this new actually new so all these newer anticoagulants have been in use for more than a decade um, and these molecules were all synthesized 20 years before its clinical use. So for all practical purposes for this talk, I'm going to stick to the term DOAX or direct oral anticoagulants. So uh, let's move on to what is the ideal anticoagulant that we want. So an ideal anticoagulant should be able, you know, something that we should be able to administer orally, should have a rapid onset and offset of action, should have a wide therapeutic window, little or no inter or intra-individual variability, little or no interaction with other drugs or food. Its pharmacokinetic and dynamic properties should be predictable. Coagulation monitoring, monitoring should not be required. There should be no dose adjustment and should be highly effective in reducing thromboembolic events with a good safety profile, especially related to bleeding. Now, unfortunately, the vitamin K antagonist that we had didn't fulfill most of these criteria for an ideal anticoagulant, except that it was orally administered and was highly effective in reducing thromboembolic events. And then came the direct oral anticoagulants. And are they the ideal anticoagulant? And to a certain extent, probably yes, because they fulfill most of the criteria uh, of, of an ideal anticoagulant, except the fact that they've got certain interactions with food and certain drugs, and they require dose adjustment in certain conditions, which we will go through in the latter part of the talk. So the DOACs, as we know, are the direct thrombin inhibitor, the factor 2A inhibitors, which in Vidabicatran, or the direct factor 10A inhibitors, which is apixaban, rivaroxaban, edoxaban, or betrixaban. So betrixaban was never released in market. So we're going to stick to talking about apixaban, rivaroxaban, and edoxaban today. So uh, you all are much more familiar with this than I am regarding the mechanism of action of DOACs. So we all know the intrinsic and extrinsic pathway of coagulation. Uh, they co coalesce at the factor 10, which gets inhibited to factor 10A. And it is this factor 10A, which is inhibited by uh, rivaroxaban, edoxaban, and apixaban. And factor 10A then uh, converts prothrombin to thrombin, which is your factor 2A, which is inhibited by dabigatran. And factor 2A is then responsible for fibrinogen to fibrin formation, which leads to the end of the coagulation cascade. Now, certain properties of these DOACs, and particularly what I want you to look at is these three effects. So one is the time to peak effect. So warfarin has a, has a long time to peak effect of almost four to five days. And this is particularly the reason why it requires bridging with other anticoagulation uh, for the first few days. Whereas all the other oral anticoagulants have a very short time to peak effect within a few hours. And that's the reason why some of these anticoagulants can be upfront used for uh, direct treatment of PEs without any bridging anticoagulation. Again, half-life, warfarin's got a very long half-life of 40 hours as compared to the rest of the direct oral anticoagulants, which is around in the range of around 10 to 14 hours. So that that makes so uh, because of this reason, warfarin remains in our system for a longer period of time associated with higher risk of bleeding. Um, but the other double-edged sword with the DOAX is the fact that because they've got a short half-life, even missing one or two doses of these DOAX, especially in the high-risk individuals, can lead to episodes of recurrent venous thromboembolism. Uh, some of these DOAX are excreted by the renal roots, especially dabigatran and edoxaban, uh, and hence uh, some of these drugs might require dose adjustments in renal impairment. So now let's look at the clinical evidence of using these DOACs in um, acute venous thromboembolism and pulmonary embolism. Uh, so when do we actually use uh, use these DOACs? So if somebody has a high risk P or is in throm is is hemodynamically unstable, they would be needing systemic thrombolysis. 
uh, if somebody's got an intermediate high risk PE, you would probably want them to be treated with initially with low molecular weight heparin, although there is some use of direct oral anticoagulants in this group as well. And it's for this low risk PEs where, you know, the patient is hemodynamically stable is, is the time that you, we, we would use DOACs as the first line of treatment. So uh, there have been six randomized controlled trials done for venous thromboembolism uh, with regards to the DOACs. Um, and they've evaluated all of them. So apixaban, rivaroxaban, edoxaban, or dabicatran. The comparator arm has been low molecular weight heparin, enoxaparin, followed by vitamin K antagonist, which was warfarin. Of these six, one was exclusively for pulmonary embolism, which was the Einstein PE, uh, which used rivaroxaban. And all these studies have had the primary efficacy outcome of recurrent venous thrombo thromboembolism during the study period. And the primary safety outcome was major bleeding or composite of major bleeding and clinically relevant non-major bleeding. All of these were non-inferiority trials, meaning they did not try to prove the superiority of DOAX over vitamin K antagonists. What they tried to prove was that the DOAX were as good as vitamin K antagonists for treatment of VTE. So before we go ahead, I would just like to uh, you know, stress a little bit about what this major bleeding and clinically relevant non-major bleeding definitions are, because you know we're going to come across this quite frequently uh, in, the, in the talk. So major bleeding is defined as overt bleeding, which leads to a fall in hemoglobin of two grams or more, which requires transfusion of two or more packed units of uh, red blood cells. Uh, the, it occurs in a critical site, which can be intracranial, intraspinal, intraocular, pericardial, intraarticular, intramuscular, and anything that contributes to death. Whereas clinically relevant non-major bleeding is any other bleeding which does not fit in the criteria of a major bleeding, uh, but leads to some sort of medical intervention. It leads to an unscheduled contact with the physician. It might lead to temporary cessation of the anticoagulation and is associated with any discomfort such as pain or difficulty or impairment of day-to-day -day activities. So from these six studies, we have very robust data available now. So more than 13,000 patients have received OAC. Uh, the mean age of these participants was somewhere around 56 years. Majority of them were men. 57% uh, of this population had DVT as their thromboembolism. Uh, and PE was seen in 43% with or without DVT. 72% received the anti anticoagulation for six months. And the overall time in the therapeutic range for patients on uh, warfarin was 57 to 64%. So this is important to know that even in a trial setting, only uh, patients with VK could remain only two-thirds of the time in their therapeutic range. Adherence to DOAX was excellent, so it was more than 80% in 95% of the participants. So let's look at these studies. So we had the Einstein DVT and the Einstein P, which looked at rivaroxaban, 15 milligrams twice a day for three weeks, followed by 20 milligrams once a day. Uh, Amplify or, or Apixaban study, which looked at 10 milligrams of Apixaban, Apixaban twice a day, followed by 5 milligrams twice a day. Edoxaban was the Hokusai VTE study, which looked at Edoxaban 60 milligrams once daily, and the Recover 1 and Recover 2 had Dabigatran 150 milligrams twice a day. So while the Apixaban and the Dabigatran study had the anticoagulation given for six months, the Rivaroxaban and Edoxaban, uh, the duration of the study was three, six, or 12 months, depending at the discretion of the physician. PE was 100% as the index event in the Einstein PE study because they looked at only uh, pulmonary embolic, embolic cases in that study. Whereas for the rest of the VTE studies, nearly one third of their patients had pulmonary embolism. So what we found in terms of outcomes, so when it was in terms of recurrent episodes of venous thromboembolism during the duration of the study, all the DOACs, whether it was rivaroxaban, apixaban, edoxaban, or dabigatran, were non-inferior to low molecular weight heparin or vitamin, and vitamin K antagonists in terms of episodes of recurrent VTE. When we looked at the other primary safety outcome of major bleeding or clinically relevant non-major bleeding, we found that the rivaroxaban and the apixaban study had, had, had little superiority over uh, enoxaparin and warfarin when it came to major bleeding and clinically relevant non-major bleeding. So what did the pooled data show? Uh, so a systematic review uh, showing a forest plot. So uh, vitamin K antagonists versus DOAX, both, ha both had similar rates of recurrent BTEs, 2.2% with warfarin, 2% with the DOAX. 
But when it came to the risk of bleeding, there was a significant relative risk reduction of nearly 40% in major bleeding with the, with the DOAX as compared to vitamin K antagonists. And when we looked at specifically only with uh, factor 10A inhibitors, which include apixaban, rivaroxaban, and adoxaban, there was significant relative risk reduction in major bleeding, intracranial bleeding, and fatal bleeding. But the GI bleeding and clinically relevant non-major bleeding did not meet statistical significance. So based on these studies, so the e uh, ERS and the ESC society guidelines into published in 2020 have given grade one as the recommendation for using NOAX uh, in a patient with PE uh, as the initial treatment for coagulation. So what have we learned so far? DOACs are non-inferior in K antagonists for TE. They are bleeding, intracranial bleeding, or fatal bleeding. Now, is there any evidence to suggest which DOAC should we use or whether we should use one over the other? Now, if we see the band study, both of them had the advantage that uh, there was direct admission of these Sorry, I think I lost my screen. We can see you now. Great. We got your screen. Yes. So the apixaban and the rivaroxaban study had a single drug approach, meaning uh, these drugs were directly administered without the need of any bridging anticoagulation. Uh, whereas both with adoxaban and dabicatran, we there was a need for bridging anticoagulation for a median of seven to nine days. So this basically does indicate the fact that adoxaban and dabicatran would need bridging anticoagulation and possibly hospital admission. Now, what we also saw in these studies was that rivaroxaban and apixaban both had some superiority when it came to risk of major bleedings and clinically relevant non-major bleeding. So with rivaroxaban, we could see definitely a, a stark improvement in the major bleeding events. And with apixaban, there was, an, there was a stark difference between major bleeding and clinically relevant non-major bleeding as compared to enoxaparin and warfarin. And, and again, a met network meta-analysis has shown that rivaroxaban and apixaban, both of them have much lesser risk of bleeding. And apixaban, in fact, has less the risk of bleeding than rivaroxaban. Now, is this just by chance or is this is there some meat to this? So before we, you know, just jump on to the fact that apixaban might be safer than rivaroxaban, let's let's look at the exclusion criteria for the rivaroxaban study or the Einstein PE study. So this was the list of the exclusion criteria for the rivaroxaban study. And this was the list. So I know this is not legible. So this was the exclusion criteria for the apixaban study. What I'm trying to show you here is the fact that the exclusion criteria for the apixaban study was much more in, uh, intensive, much more uh, uh, it was it was it was it was three times than that of the rivaroxaban study. So probably they had a much more robust and a more fitter population, which led to lead which led to lesser uh, bleeding events. But nonetheless, this led to the Cobra study, and this is the first head-to-head -head trial which is looking at rivaroxaban versus apixaban for the treatment of acute venous thromboembolism, um, and it's a head-to-head -head Canadian trial. And the primary outcome here that they're looking at is, is as a comparison of bleeding risk, uh, which is the rate of adjudicated clinically relevant bleeding events at three months, which is a composite of major bleeding and clinically relevant non-major bleeding. So this is going to be a landmark study. It's ex ex uh, expected to be published in 2024. And this might give us some idea in terms of superiority of one DOAC over the other. Uh, so based on the fact that rivaroxaban and apixaban have a simpler, have, a, have are much easier to use with no bridging requirement and probably safer with decreased bleeding risks, uh, this was the Google trend usage for DOACs, which has clearly shown an increase in the use of rivaroxaban and apixaban over the past seven to eight years, with a decrease in the usage of dabicatran, edoxaban, and warfarin. So what have we learned so far? that apixaban and rivaroxaban do not require bridging anticoagulation. There is no head-to-head -head trial comparing DOAC efficacy, but apixaban and rivaroxaban are associated with lower risk of bleeding. 
Now let's move on to use of DOAX in extended anticoagulation. So we all know that the risk of recurrence for unprovoked uh, VTE is 5 to 7% per year for individuals. Uh, the problems, so before the advent of DOAX, so VKA of warfarin was used for extended anticoagulation. The problem with warfarin was that it had the high risk of major bleeding, which is almost 3% per year. And even though when they tried the lower intensity INR, meaning using a targeted INR of 1.8 to 2.2, they found that it was less effective than the full dose to prevent recurrent VTE. So then three DOACs have been tested, which is dabigatran, rivaroxaban, and apixaban. And low dose apixaban, which is 2.5 milligrams BID, and rivaroxaban, 10 milligrams OD, have also been tested. So what are what have the what is the data shown? So we had the Einstein extension, which was usual dose rivaroxaban versus placebo, a significant reduction in uh, in thrombotic events and bleeding rates as compared to placebo. The Amplify extension looked at usual dose apixaban with a lower dose apixaban and placebo. And this study had 90% of the population which had unprovoked VTE. So that's why we see that the rate of uh, recurrent VTE in the placebo group is as high as around 12%. The Resonate and the Remedy trials were done with Dabigatran. Uh, dabigatran versus placebo was the resonate and the remedy looked at dabigatran versus warfarin and dabigatran is the only drug which has been tested against warfarin in extended anticoagulation whereas all the others have been tested against placebo the einstein choice looked at rivaroxaban at usual dose rivaroxaban at 10 milligrams od and aspirin at uh, 100 milligrams while the uh, Pixaban and uh, the Dabigatran study extend, gave anti extended anticoagulation for 12 months, the Rivaroxaban studies gave it for 6 to 12 months, again, at the discretion of the physicians. So what we saw was on the forest plot was that DOAX versus placebo or DOAX versus warfarin for extended anticoagulation, there was an overall 75% reduced risk for recurrent VTE. Now, what's important to see that 74% of the weight of the forest plot is drawn by placebo. So, you know, probably if there was a head to head comparison between DOAX versus warfarin, probably it would be a non inferior trial as well. What about major or clinical relevant bleeding? Again, DOAX versus placebo or DOAX versus warfarin, there was a significant increased risk of bleeding at 78%. But again, most of the, the weight of this forest plot is again drawn by placebo, where the risk of bleeding was much lesser. When we looked at the reduced dose, so when you had reduced dose of DOAC versus either no anticoagulation or full of dose of the DOAC, and we looked at the risk of re recurrent VTE, so significant reduction at 74% re relative risk reduction with reduced dose DOAC as compared to no anticoagulation. And between the reduced dose and the full dose of anticoagulation, both of them were equally efficacious to prevent a recurrent VTE. What about risk of bleeding again? So there was no increased risk of bleeding with reduced dose DOAC as compared to placebo or no, no anticoagulation. And there was a 26% relative risk reduction with reduced dose DOAC as compared to full dose DOAC. So again, what do the ESC and ERS guidelines tell us? That if extended oral anticoagulation is recommended in patients with P after six months of uh, anticoagulation, then use either Pixaban 2.5 BD or Rivaroxaban at 10 milligrams OD. So what have we learned? So DOACs are superior to placebo to prevent recurrent VTE in patients needing extended anticoagulation for 12 months. DOACs associated with increased bleeding risk as compared to placebo in patients needing extended anticoagulation. And low dose DOACs are associated with lesser risk of bleeding as compared to placebo or full dose and lesser risk of recurrent VTE as compared to placebo. Now let's move on to certain practical considerations that we need to take into account when we prescribing patients with DOAX. So the contraindication to DOAX in all these VTE trials was uh, so pregnant ladies and breastfeeding ladies were lactating ladies were excluded. Patients with mechanical heart valves were excluded. Uh, patients with antiphospholipid syndrome were excluded. Severe renal impairment defined as creatinine clearance of less than 15 ml per minute and severe hepatic impairment defined as the child perk score of 10 to 15 were excluded. Body weight of less than 50 or more than 120 is a soft indication. So now there are studies which have looked at usage of these anticoagulants at uh, more uh, for individuals more than 120 and have found to be efficacious. 
So uh, the ESC and the ERS guidelines again recommend us that you know should not be used in patients with renal impairment, pregnancy, lactation, and patients with the antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. What about interaction with food? So uh, of all the and of all the DOACs, uh, rivaroxaban has significant interaction with food, and its absorption is increased by almost forty percent with food. Um, Five to ten percent of patients with dabigatran can have dyspepsia, uh, so it's extremely important to uh, recommend your patient to take rivaroxaban either in the acute phase when they're using twenty milligram tab, uh, sorry, fifteen milligram tablets or twenty milligram tablets to be taken with food. Uh, Doax and renal impairment. So uh, probably apixaban and rivaroxaban are the safest drugs to be used in patients with uh, renal impairment. So as we've discussed, creatinine clearance of less than 15 is almost an absolute contraindication to use Doax. Between 15 to 30 ml per minute, uh, dabigatran is contraindicated, but the rest can be used with caution at a reduced dose. Between 30 to 50, uh, while apixaban can be used at full dose, if the patient is less than 80 years of age, has a weight of more than 60 and creatinine of less than 1.4, rivaroxaban and adoxaban need to be used at lower doses, whereas dabigatran needs to be uh, used with caution. As we'd seen in the previous slide, dabigatran is almost 80% excreted by the renal root. Uh, above 50 to 9, between 50 and 95 ml per minute, all of the anticoagulants are safe to be used. Uh, but above 95 ml per minute, edoxaban has to be used with caution. Similar with hepatic impairment, with mild hepatic impairment, with a child perk score of 5 to 6, all of the anticoagulants can be used. With moderate uh, hepatic impairment, it's Rivaroxaban is contraindicated, whereas the others can be used with caution. And in severe hepatic impairment, the DOACs are contraindicated. Certain drug interactions have just picked up the most common ones. So with rifampicin, uh, since it's an inducer of the P-glycoprotein and the CYP3A4 uh, cytochrome uh, in inducer, it leads to a significant reduction in the uh, anticoagulant activity of all the DOACs. So hence, rifampicin is probably contraindicated. Uh, so DOACs are probably contraindicated on patients with rifampicin. With ritonavir, PGP is to much higher levels of uh, the DOAX leading to increased risk of bleeding and hence they again contraindicated. So what we've learned is that before initiation of DOAX, it's important to check the renal function, hepatic function and drug interactions and always administer rivaroxaban with food. Now coming to the last uh, section of my talk, which is the use of uh, these DOAX in special situations such as cancer. So we all know that there's a cumulative increase in cancer-associated VTE uh, as compared to the general population. So there's a 13-fold higher risk of VTE with cancer diagnosis, and it increases to 23-fold if the cancer is active and the patient is undergoing chemotherapy or targeted therapy. So what about the RCTs in cancer-associated VTE? So only factor 10A inhibitors have been tested, which is include rivaroxaban, apixaban, and edoxaban. The comparator arm, as compared to the non-cancer VTE, which was always low molecular weight, uh, which was always anoxaparin plus warfarin, here the comparator arm has always been daltoparin. And in one study, known as the CANVAS study, any of the DOACs were allowed to be used as per the discretion of the treating physician in the intervention arm. What the studies have shown is that there's a significant risk of a uh, significant risk reduction by nearly 30% with DOAX as compared to low molecular weight heparin for recurrent VTEs. Uh, they associated for major bleedings. There's a relative increase by almost 17% for DOAX as compared to low molecular weight heparin. And for risk of non uh, clinically relevant non major bleeding, the relative risk is almost increases by 66%. Now, when a subgroup analysis was done, it was found that there was increased GI bleeding with unresected GI or GU intraluminal tumors. So what does this mean for us? So if a patient has cancer-associated VTE, there's risk of bleeding with thrombocytopenia, previous GI bleed, previous variceal bleeds, use of antiplatelet uh, agents. So they are high risk. So you would probably want to use low molecular weight heparin. If there is no uh, high risk of bleeding and, and if it's a, a non-GI or GU cancer, you would want to use a DOAC. Uh, if the cancer is still active, you would want to continue extended prophylaxis. Uh, you would want to continue extended thromboembolic uh, treatment. Uh, but if the if the patient has an intraluminal unresected GI or GU cancer, you would want to continue with a low molecular weight heparin. 
So how long do we treat cancer associated VT? So this is a fine balance between morbidity or mortality from recurrent VTE versus morbidity or mortality from major bleed. And what we've seen is, is the forest plot of all the studies done for cancer associated VTE. So there was a 15% case fatality rate of recurrent VTE and cancer associated VTE. And when they looked at the risk of major bleeding, so there was a 10% case fatality rate for bleeding in cancer associated VTE. So this is quite uh, contrasting to risk of bleeding versus risk of thrombosis in a non-cancer population where the risk of uh, bleeding remains stable every year, but the risk of and uh, risk of thrombosis actually decreases. Whereas in the cancer population, the risk of recurrent VTE is much higher than the risk of bleeding. So the morbidity or mortality from uh, recurrent VTE is much higher in mort from mort morbidity or mortality from major bleed. And hence it is recommended that uh, the, again, the ESC and the ERS guidelines recommend that in patients with PE and cancer, extended anticoagulation beyond six months should be considered for an indefinite period or the till the cancer is cured. So again, they recommend edoxaban and rivaroxaban. Uh, apixaban will probably come up in the new guidelines. This was published in 2019 and 20 before the apixaban for cancer-associated VT trial was published in 2020. Again, the ASH guidelines recommend upfront usage of DOAX for uh, patients with cancer-associated VTE. And again, long-term cancer treatment for patients with extended anticoagulation for patients with active cancer. And also the oncology guidelines recommend the same, except that they recommend usage of low molecular weight heparin for the first 10 days uh, for established VT, followed by the DOAX. So is any role of prophylactic dosing in ca cancer-associated VTE? So uh, trials are underway. So this is a trial with Pixaban, which is looking at full dose versus reduced dose uh, for a period of 12 months following extended uh, following anticoagulation after six months and, and results are underway in the next year or two. So what have we learned? So DOAX are uh, including rivaroxaban, apixaban and eroxaban provide an effective option to low molecular weight heparin for cancer associated VTE. An extended duration of anticoagulation for secondary prevention should be considered in all patients at high risk of recurrence. So now just to conclude, uh, so this is my last slide. So the greatest benefits of DOAX are likely to be in patients who are previously deemed unsuitable for VK therapy. So I think that's the first major indication for usage of DOAX. And the most compelling rationale for prefer preferring DOAX over VKs is their greater convenience and lower risk of life-threatening bleeding. Clinicians should continue to expand the preferential use of DOAX for patients with approved indications with the aim of further reducing the burden of preventable thromboembolism and the emergence of less expensive generic version of DOAX will definitely help to make this approach more affordable. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Radhika. That was wonderful. Great uh, update, a lot of learning. Thanks for sparing your time and educating us. So before we come to a Q&A session with you, we have got two things to complete. One is I'm going to give the answer to the quiz. Then we will have Dr. Bhave's lecture. And then we will have the combined Q&A session. i just share my screen. So Sunday quiz, which was put to you this morning, was related to a case profile and certain skin lesions. That was the skin lesion. And the profile, if I repeat, this was an elderly woman with Walden strong. She was treated with bendamustine rituximab for four months. She got certain skin lesions and you were asked to give the diagnosis. And the punch biopsy has shown perivascular and interstitial eosinophilic infiltrate. These were the options given to you. Waldenstrom infiltrating the skin, amyloidosis secondary to Waldenstrom, sweet syndrome, bendamustine rituximab, primary autoimmune skin disease, paraneoplastic skin disease, or none of the above. So the punch biopsy had revealed perivascular interstitial eosinophilic infiltrate. This was consistent with the diagnosis of bullous pemphigoid. Bullous pemphigoid or BP is a well-described, although rare, dermatological reaction associated with bendamustin. Our patient was on bendamustin and rituximab. Rituximab is not known to produce BP. Rather, it is used for treating BP. 
Bendamustine is known to produce skin reactions in almost every third patient. The skin lesion in this patient resolved completely after evacuation, steroid therapy, and discontinuation of bendamustine. Bullas pemphigoid is the most frequent autoimmune subepidermal blistering disease, which affects individuals above the age of 60. It is often triggered by exposure to drugs. The clinical features are extremely polymorphous. Some of the clinical features include there is an absence of mucosal involvement, there's an absence of lesions on the neck and head, and there's an absence of atrophic scars at the time of healing. The diagnostic, the diagnosis critically relies on immunopathologic findings, where there is documentation of autoantibodies directed against the bullous pemphigoid antigen 180 and 230. So the correct option in our case was number four, that is bendamustine skin toxicity, and exactly it was bullous pemphigoid. We got 71 answers, of which only four were correct. And the four correct, three were Dr. Bilal Kazi, Dr. Radhika Sethi, and Dr. Anupama Jagya. These were the second, third, and fourth in the order between 11.42 a.m. and 11.44 a.m. And the fastest finger fast was Dr. Arun V.A. at 11.41. Dr. Arun V.A. Uh, has been regularly attending the webinars and has been attempting to answer the quiz. Congratulations to you, Dr. Arun. He is MBBS MD, Senior Resident, Department of Hematology at PGI Chandigarh. And it's possible that by now he has finished his uh, super specialty course and he may be a faculty. So congratulations to you. This case contributor was Dr. Ivan Sivetini from Hematology Division, San Gerardo Hospital, Monza, Italy. And this is published in the British Journal of Hematology Table Issue. So that was the quiz. Now we come to our second guest speaker for the day and that's our colleague and friend, Dr. Abhay Bhave. He's well known in the community of hematology, so I don't have to really introduce him, but completing the formalities. He's consulted hematologist at Leelawati Hospital, Global Hospital, and Empire Center, Mumbai. He was a fellow in hematology at Christian Medical College, Bello. He's done fellowship in hematology from Royal College of Pathologists of Australasia, FRCPA. Member of the ICMA Task Force for National Guidelines for MDS. Member of National Guidelines for DVT. Member of the Newer Anticoagulants Guidelines. Is member for Guidelines on Pulmonary Embolism. Chief Editor of the Dilawati Hospital Medical Times. International Editorial Board of JGOG of Academy of Global Obstetrics and Gynecology. His guest Editor Mahima Maharashtra IMA of Practical Hematology and Hematology Section Editor in the Indian Practitioner. His council member of the Marrow Donor Registry of India was awarded Dr. B. R. Rama Subramaniam from Indian Medical Association in 2016-17. He was awarded Ekta Manch Award for Community Service in 2007 and he has received several national, and he has to his name, several national and international publications. He's going to lecture on unusual site thrombosis to treat as usual or not. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Agarwal, sir. Uh, thank you, Mumbai Hematology Group. Uh, thank you, the platform uh, that uh, uh, we are speaking on just now. And uh, thank you, uh, Professor Kashyap, for your beautiful small capsule, which has actually said everything that I want to say in a nutshell. Uh, I hope I'm audible and my slide is seen. Yes. So my job description over the next 30 or so minutes is uh, to look at unusual site DVT or VT. And the issue is how do we treat and how do we approach whether we treat or we don't treat. 
So um, unusual site venous thromboembolism is a frequent reason for uh, consultation amongst hematology. And um, uh, uncommon thrombosis are considered to be the ones uh, which are outside the veins of the lower extremities and the pulmonary arteries. So we are basically going to be discussing on splanchnic and cerebral veins. These unusual site thrombosis represent a diagnostic and therapeutic challenge because of its heterogeneity in clinical presentation. The limited ev evidence available in literature on the acute and long-term prognosis of these disease and lack of randomized controlled trials which evaluate treatment protocols. Essentially, a lot of these uh, recommendations are based on systematic uh, reviews and meta-analysis. They have unique presentations, pathophysiology, workup, and treatments that we as hematologists and physicians should be aware of. Splanchnic DVT may need a look for occult Ill illnesses and need a unique workup and treatment plan, which is not part of the usual DVT. Despite the rarity of these conditions, they are detected with far more increased frequency in today's world because of our colleagues in imaging and radiology, which pick up these asymptomatic or uh, mild uh, thrombosis in a large number of situations, and we are then presented these cases. In today's discussion, um, each of these, that is the intra-abdominal thrombosis, primarily but chiari, portal vein thrombosis, cortical vein thrombosis, and COVID-19 related, each one is a webinar on its own. So I'll hope that you uh, allow me to be more um, circumspect, uh, give an approach, in short, or how to suspect, diagnose, and treat these conditions. So I'll start with intra-abdominal intra uh, thrombosis, and I'm hoping that my laser pointer will be seen. Veins from the right side of the gut are collectively going into what is called a superior mesentric vein, and from the left go into the inferior mesentric vein, and they're all joined by various veins coming through the intestines. The inferior mesentric vein is joined by the splenic vein, which has much more smaller tribute tributaries joining it, and they all confluent into the uh, hepatic portal vein or the main portal vein, which then go goes upwards into the IVC. As we go upwards, we've got the right and left portal veins also, and we've got uh, the hepatic veins, the three hepatic veins, the right, left, and middle, and then the inferior vena cava. Uh, so thrombosis in the abdomen as an unusual site of thrombosis could be at multiple sites like the spleen, inferior superior mesentric vein, the main portal vein, either portal veins, and the hepatic veins, and the uh, inferior vena cava. Now, uh, for the sake of discussion, the hepatic portal veins, splenic vein, and the mesentric veins with the hepatic vein, all of them together are called under one roof, and that is splanchnic veins. And many times the term SVT is used, splen splanchnic venous thrombosis. So how do I suspect an intra-abdominal venous thrombosis? Um, there's a possibility that about a third of patients may remain asymptomatic and picked up by our colleagues on imaging for a reason other than actually looking for a thrombosis. However, if there is a thrombosis, the patient is symptomatic, abdominal pain, the formation of ascitic fluid and gastrointestinal bleeding are the front runners. So if that is the kind of presentation, we would think more proactively towards the presence of an intra-abdominal thrombosis. Now, just uh, having a clinical suspicion of an intra-abdominal thrombosis is not equal to uh, saying that it is a clot and you can't treat on speculation. So how do we then prove our, di our, uh, our clinical thought of uh, a thrombosis? So then to diagnose, I think if you look at the three main veins, portal vein, mesentric, and butchiari, uh, a Doppler ultrasound is one of the best ways. Why? Because it's easily available. Most hospitals, uh, smaller nursing homes, and standalone clinics would have it. And it is uh, rather cheap as compared to the other two imaging. But the fact remains that as you go from Doppler to CT to MR angiography, um, there is more sensitivity and better specificity. Now, the, the advantage of CT might be that it is more sensitive than Doppler in the assessment of thrombus extension, especially into the mesentric veins, which is a very important vein to treat. And Doppler then, while it's available and cheaper, is very operator dependent and therefore it depends upon the level of expertise of the person using the Doppler machine and his level of interest in doing that procedure. On the other hand, MRI angiography can be more accurate than Doppler especially to pick up these smaller partial thrombosis, which now all societies are saying 
even if they're asymptomatic, one needs to treat and therefore picking it up is important. And usually MR, is, MR uh, angiography is done when a CT angiogram has been contraindicated, but the MR angiography has a very high 100% sensitivity and specificity to make a diagnosis. And the advantage of MR venogram is also that it is able to look at the inferior vena cava to see whether there is a thrombus, because that's a thrombus which can give rise to a lot of, uh, not only pulmonary embolism, but also a lot of morbidity uh, because of the persistence of thrombosis. Uh, as far as um, the post thrombophlebitic syndrome is concerned with lots of venous ulcerations and very thick legs. But now with the advent of the contrast enhanced ultrasound Doppler, we are able to pick up much better, not only thrombosis in the portal vein, especially in other veins, but we can also differentiate from a cancer related thrombosis of the portal vein. So we can have a much better differentiation of a tumor in the thrombus uh, kind of uh, thrombotic event uh, with the help of a contrast medium. So that is gaining access, especially in, in, uh, in hospitals which have the talent uh, and the expertise to do so. Once you've made a diagnosis with the, with the modality that you have used uh, or that is available to you, then uh, look, we can look at several guidelines. Essentially, if you look at the indication, it's clear that those who are symptomatic need to be treated. Those who have got an incidental detected uh, uh, splanking splen uh, splen uh, thrombosis as per ACCP of 2012 was not going to be treated unless there was cancer, it's extensive, and if there is an ongoing chemotherapy for the cancer, with there is a progression of the thrombosis on a repeat scanning. So then it was going to be used. In the American Association for Study of Liver Diseases, it was very clear that they should receive anticoagulation. And if there is gastric or esophageal varices, that should not be a contraindication for anticoagulation. But one must take care of the gastric and esophageal varices by doing an endoscopy, giving beta blockers, and ligating the uh, varices if there's a ten tendency to bleed. Because I must make it clear that the chances of bleeding are more because of the varices and portal hypertension rather than coagulopathy. And in the Bavino 6 consensus, which is a beautiful town in Italy, um, they showed that uh, not only they should be started immediately on treatment, irrespective whether it is uh, symptomatic or asymptomatic, uh, for patients who are cirrhotic and have a portal vein thrombosis, uh, we should anticoagulate and not be worried about the risk of bleeding, especially if they're candidates for um, liver transplant or in patients who show an extension to the mesenteric vessels or there's an ongoing strong prothrombotic indicator. And the preference of uh, the treatment of choice is low molecule weight heparin, which will be followed by a VKA uh, if there is no contraindication to giving oral treatment. And the INR is kept at 2 to 3 and not higher than two to three, there's no further recommendation. As far as duration, it has been extrapolated from data in other sites of thrombosis. So really not too much data is available for this, but a standard three months is the standard amount of treatment that is given to everyone who gets a thrombus, especially if there's a, uh, reverse, if there's a provoking factor which can be reversed. In that case, it is stopped at three months. Its extension is based on the clinician's view of how the patient's clinical profile has been. So it can be extended further, especially if there is a persistent risk factor that is ongoing, or it can be long-term if there is a Bud Chiari syndrome or a mesenteric vein thrombosis, or if there is any provoking factor which is going to be long-term like a myeloproliferative neoplasm. Now, my clinical thoughts in abdominal vein DVT are that we should look for MPNs. And Dr. Professor Kashyap's initial statement was that he's, he's seen more malignancies in these unusual sites, and I completely agree with him. Because 58% of the times in Bud-Chiari syndrome, you might have uh, JAK2 positivity or MPNs as a cause. And the reason you have to pick it up is because they have recurrent thrombosis. PNH is the other one. Heritable thrombosis may play a role in abdominal vein thrombosis, but they are not recommended to be performed because they can be falsely low at the time of an acute thrombosis, and therefore they are not diagnostic. And there's no evidence that their reduction alters the management of the patient. Likewise, even some gene variations are not recommended. And uh, as time goes along, we will see that, you know, we wanted to look for malignancy. But the way we do investigations for diagnosis of a thrombus in the intra-abdominal, it includes certain methodologies that will look for evidence of malignancy in them. 
for example the ct and mri will also pick up any uh, space occupying tumors or lesions or malignancies that are there in this patient so inadvertently we will be able to make out if there's a concurrent malignancy present as far as anti phospholipid antibodies are concerned there are about 25% and therefore they are very important tests to be done and we should not miss out on that opportunity why because whether it's provoked or unprovoked they are important for choice of therapy and especially when it comes to doax as was beautifully outlined earlier by uh, by dr radhika if you got a patient of who has got a multi system organ involvement and the patient is obtunded and is in a sick condition a cap should be kept in mind so a catastrophic anti phospholipid antibody syndrome would be a reason and is a one of the thing where you will not use the usual treatment you might have to give additional treatment including in the form of uh, immunoglobulins uh, to such patients along with high dose steroids and rituximab and while heritable causes are inherited apla syndrome is an acquired feature therefore if a patient is acquired apla positive it does not mean you have to do the family's test and the reason why i'm so not in favor of inherited thrombophilia is because if you got a clinical history which shows that there was a significant thrombotic load in the patient was sick and the d dimer was high in selected patient at the end of say 3 to 6 months of treatment then these patients continue to remain at risk for thrombosis and you would continue the anticoagulation irrespective of what thrombophilic profile was there underlying at the same time if the at the end of 3 to 6 months the clinical profile at the beginning was not significant and the d dimer has come back to normal then irrespective of the presence of a thrombophilic state if the d dimer is negative the chance of continuing therapy is much lesser although it's the physician's discretion so in abdominal dvt not only are we looking for systemic causes but there are lots of local causes which thankfully will be picked up by the imaging that we are doing to actually make the diagnosis of the thrombus both should be looked at thrombosis of the portal vein is seen in 77% of patients who have got splanchnic vein thrombosis with 38% of these actually extending by the time they come to light to the other splanchnic vessels around if it's a chronic portal vein thrombosis there's a lot of issue about whether we should a treat to give them anticoagulation or not if they are symptomatic they will be treated if it's an incidental finding then chronic pvt have not benefited out of uh, giving anticoagulation especially if they are non serotic however if they are serotic then that cirrhosis itself is a reason for getting thrombosis and hence even if they are asymptomatic they would be treated with an anticoagulation provided the clinical profile allows and the duration should be long term but chiari syndrome or hepatic vein thrombosis is a rare disorder and it can present with acute liver failure and cephalopathy ascitic fluid and portal hypertension they can still be about 20% who are asymptomatic but the majority will be symptomatic again jacto mutation oral contraceptive pills systemic inflammatory responses and inherited thrombophilia can be some of the reasons that can contribute to the formation of this thrombus but in addition don't miss out on malignancy due to local extension of a tumor intrahepatic abscesses by virtue of inflammation parasitic abscess for the same reason or trauma can also contribute to thrombosis in these patients anticoagulation should be initi initiated immediately and if you were to do that and pick it up in 1 to 2 weeks and start treatment then the five year survival rate is 74% which is excellent in most cases anticoagulation but care syndrome is indefinite even if they are asymptomatic in those 20% especially if an underlying thrombophilia is found I'm sorry if this is not very clear, but I'll go through this. We are going to give anticoagulation if, for any reason, anticoagulation is not beneficial. We should do uh, and ask for talent to take care of percutaneous angioplasty and stenting to help in the recanalization, which is so important to see that tissue ischemia does not prolong. If that doesn't work, is not possible. Then we go to tips that is transhepatic portosystemic shunt, and if that also fails, then we have to prep this patient for a liver transplantation. now incidental versus symptomatic uh, to treat or not to treat it's very clear uh, from data in a retrospective study that for incidental splenic vein and isolated portal vein thrombosis there is some data that watchful waiting approach might be beneficial and uh, the reason is because spontaneous thrombosis regression was seen in almost 50% uh, with another 45% showing stability in non progression and progression only in seven the only exception is mesenteric vein thrombosis where the 30 day mortality is 20% and therefore you should not be watchful waiting another international prospective study this time of 604 patients in splanchnic vein thrombosis showed that the relative risk for major bleeding is 3.8 and the relative risk for recurrent thrombosis is 7.3 in the untreated phase 
the moment you give the patient anticoagulation, the major bleeding remains the same, so it's not increased, and the recurrent thrombosis comes down significantly. Therefore, it's worth giving anticoagulation. And when you stop the anticoagulation, obviously the risk of major bleeding will come down significantly, but the risk of recurrent thrombosis will go up manifold, uh, uh, suggesting that we should be very careful while discontinuing anticoagulation. The reason why symptomatic patients were thought to be treated and not asymptomatic by ACCP in 2012 is because symptomatic patients have doubled the risk of getting recurrent thrombosis than bleeding. Hence, that was needed. While the risk of recurrent thrombosis versus bleeding was the same in asymptomatic patients, hence that level of recommendation was not to treat. However, today, the AASLD and the ISTH 2020 say that you should give all of them anticoagulation. So, in my last slide for this planktonic vein thrombosis, it's very clear from data that if you look at time points and endpoints, if you were to anticoagulate the patient with SVT, the chance of venous recanalization is threefold as those who are not uh, uh, given anticoagulation. And if you look at thrombosis progression, the recurrence of thrombosis, major bleeding, and overall mort mortality, it's far superior when you are given anticoagulation versus when you are not given anticoagulation. I'll come to the second part of the discussion, which is on cortical sinus thrombosis. This is an important cause of stroke in young adults, uh, usually in the 30s, uh, preponderance of female, and it can either be the cerebral venous sinus thrombosis or the cortical vein thrombosis. It may be difficult to diagnose because sometimes the symptoms are nonspecific. They can be divided into acute, subacute, and chronic forms. And generally, this cortical sinus thrombosis has a favorable prognosis if it is diagnosed and treated early or else it can result in death and permanent disability. By acute, we mean less than 24 or uh, less than 48 hours. Subacute is less than 30 days, and chronic is uh, when it has been detected around 30 days or more. The incidence, thankfully, is less, but don't be fooled by it because when autopsies was done, it was 9.3% in consecutive autopsy series, suggesting that we are missing large number of particles sinus thrombosis, just as we saw it in the uh, Chandigarh, uh, uh, PGI Chandigarh data on uh, pulmonary embolism. Uh, this is three times more common in women than men, especially during pregnancy and puerperium and the use of oral contraceptive pills. So how do I suspect a cortical vein thrombosis? Especially when patients have got headache for reasons in the past which are not related to a thrombosis. If there are new risk factors like an oral contraceptive pill, pregnancy, puerperium, malignancy, and yes, now the ISTH has included anemia and obesity as independent risk factors for cortical sinus thrombosis. If a patient is known to have headache, then a new onset headache with new findings, a raised intracranial pressure, focal neurological signs, altered con consciousness and seizures are very good indicators that this headache might have an underlying thrombotic potential. And the reason why headache is common is because of stretching of the nerve fibers in the vessel walls of the sinuses and the cortical veins due to increased uh, cranial pressure, pro-inflammatory mediators release, and subarytenoid hemorrhage. Just like I showed you a cartoon of the intra-abdominal vessels, I'm going to show you a similar one uh, for the brain. This is the superior sagittal sinus with cortical veins draining into it, including the vein of prolard, the inferior sagittal sinus, which is joined by the internal cerebral vein, other in, uh, cerebral veins, and the vein of gallon, which empties into the straight sinus, which along with the superior sagittal sinus goes into the transverse sinus, which, uh, uh, in which the uh, uh, vein of labi uh, is uh, draining into. And these, this then drains into the sigmoid, which goes onto the jugular vein. Don't forget, there's a cavernous sinus, which is also a huge sinus, which along with the petrosal sinus drains into the jugular veins. Now, I'm going to not go into the details, but I'm going to just impress upon you that different thrombosis at different sites will give you different symptomatology, as opposed to abdominal pain, GI bleeding, and uh, ascites in, in the abdomen. So this is going to be more difficult for the neurologist to make a decision as to what is going to be, uh, you know, whether it's going to be a, a, a intracranial thrombosis or not. So the symptoms would depend. So irrespective of whether it's a thrombosis of the cerebral veins or the cerebral venous sinuses, both result in increased venular and capillary pressure and decreased CSF absorption, leading to intracranial pressure, cytotoxic and vasogenic edema, disruption of the blood-brain barrier, parenchymal hemorrhage, and hemorrhagic infarct, which is why you'll notice that all the uh, guidelines have said 
uh, intracerebral hemorrhage is not a contraindication to treatment of venous thromboembolism because the very reason that the thrombus is there, the patient has a bleed and therefore you must treat it even if there is a bleed. How do I diagnose cortical sinus thrombosis? If you were to do just a CT of the brain, 30% of the times you're going to miss the diagnosis of a cortical sinus sinus thrombosis. Hence, you have to include a, include a venogram. So it is CT venography or MR venography. CT venography is good. Uh, visualization of the major vessels. However, the smaller and the superficial vessels might be better picked up MRI. It's quick. It's readily available in most hospitals. Fewer motion artif artifacts. And in certain situations, it can be used far better. Unlike that in MRI, the amount of uh, assessment of the brain is far superior. There is no radiation exposure. And you can pick up the early ischemic changes, including that called brush sign, which shows that there is ischemia. So if you look at MRI, it's the most sensitive technique, demonstrating not only the presence of thrombus, but the stage of the thrombus and the, uh, the, the, the phase of the thrombus, whether it's acute or subacute. And it looks at the parenchyma very well. So it tells you whether there's any parenchymal malignancy which could have initiated the thrombus as a local cause. One last point in the MRI. Sometimes the CT gives you a thrombus, but if you look in the MRI, it's actually a stenosed vessel rather than a thrombus. And MRI is very good at picking up a stenosed vessel as opposed to thrombosis. And therefore, someone who you had labeled as a cortical vein thrombosis may actually be a a stenosis rather than a thrombosis, and you'll be unnecessarily treating them with anticoagulant. There are several risk factors, local, I think Dr. Bhave is facing some major problem. In that case, uh, Dr. Radhika Banka, can we take uh, questions for you? Sure, sir. Okay, so all the faculty that is present over here, the discussants, if you would like, you can open your videos and you can use raise hand sign to ask questions to Dr. Radhika. Dr. Anupama, you want to begin? You are muted. You are muted, Dr. Anupama. Uh, unmute yourself. Unmute. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, that was a very nice talk, Dr. Radhika. Uh, thank you. Just on, a, uh, just on a practical note, uh, out of interest, I wanted to hear. Uh, what we find here in the UK is that, uh, uh, you know, over the last few years, with all the, we have a lot of elderly population and so we have a lot, we face a lot of intracerebral bleeding also as complications. Uh, and especially with DOACs, reversal is a problem. 
So what we are finding is that uh, apixaben is getting more popular than rivaroxaben. Yeah. The reason being the twice daily dosing and also the fact that after six months, if we have to continue indefinitely after six months, we are lowering the dose to uh, 2.5 milligrams twice daily. Uh, so what is the experience like um, in India, Mumbai? Uh, that's a, a great question. And I think we, we're following a similar pattern as well. So if somebody, so my practice personally is that if somebody needs extended anticoagulation beyond six months, um, I prefer a Pixaban 2.5 milligrams twice a day, uh, assuming their kidney renal function, all of, all of that is fine. So, um, but obviously DOACs are still not as popular in India as compared to the West, uh, primarily because of the cost issue. Um, but I've, I mean, because I practice at a private center, you know, a private hospital, most of the uh, patients here can afford DOACs. Uh, but I think in the in the larger scheme of things, DOACs, you know, till the time we don't have generic options available, I think they are still, you know, they're not as widely used as they are in the West. Um, I, I'm sure MB Agrawal sir and Dr. Bhavani sir would have much more to add on this, you know, in terms of the usage of DOACs, you know, extended anticoagulation that we need. And, you know, is it is it as um, upfront that we see with all patients or is affordability actually an issue here? I'm so sorry, I got disconnected. I mean, it hasn't happened so far. It's a first, <laughs> but I think it's always there. We, we, we were just discussing. Uh, uh, yeah, we, we just took up some questions in the meanwhile. Uh, I don't know if you want to go back to your talk or we continue. With what a, what about Dr. Agarwal? Uh, sir, whatever sir, sir says. We'll come back to Dr. Bhave, but we just finished these couple of questions which are lying there. And there. Dr. Bhave, have you finished? Yes, that's all. Thank you. Okay. There are two questions in the question box. We can just finish them up. Dr. Ketan Nathani wants to know, in unprovoked pulmonary thrombosis, what is the duration of anticoagulation? That's a, a really good question. And I think, uh, I don't think there's a, a clear cut answer to that. I think it uh, you need to weigh the risks of uh, prolonged anticoagulation and what actually led to the uh, unprovoked PE and how, how, um, how severe was it? So if somebody's had a high risk PE, which was unprovoked, then perhaps you would want to give them lifelong anticoagulation because the risk of another PE is quite high in this, these individuals. Whereas if somebody's had a very subsegmental or segmental unprovoked PE, uh, you know, you might want to reassess whether you want to give anticoagulation for a longer period or not. So I don't think there are any guidelines which tell us uh, how long should an unprovoked PE be treated, but it just tells us that every year, even if you're giving extended anticoagulation, you need to assess every year the risk of bleeding versus the risk of uh, thrombotic events. Um, and But what we do know is if you're giving an extended anticoagulation, a re reduced dose definitely works as well as dose and it's not superior to giving no anticoagulation. Thank you, Dr. Radhika. The question is, do you treat incidentally detected pulmonary thrombi? So, uh, again, a really good question. So, I think uh, incidentally detected pulmonary thrombi in the setting of cancer, yes, 100% you would treat it. Uh, Personally, my opinion is still to treat uh, incidentally detected thrombi, uh, although there are now trends and there are studies actually in the West which have shown that these incidentally de detected thrombi, even if you don't treat them, does not lead to recurrent VTEs or um, uh, you know uh, larger episodes of VTEs in the future. But my personal practice is to still treat the incidentally detected thrombi for, for three to six months. Okay, thank you. So those were the two questions in the question box. If you are with us, then maybe there will be more questions coming up. We can finish with the remaining lecture of Dr. Abhay Bhavi. Yes, sir. Uh, I again profusely apologize for the network uh, issue. Like I said, it hasn't happened to me before. This is the first time. Uh, so I'm just assuming that uh, I was hurt till here. Uh, sir, is that right? Yes. I was hurt till the uh, till the risk factor for CVT. And yes, you are. Right. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, uh, uh, the other factor which is different to cortical sinus thrombosis as, uh, as opposed to intra-abdominal are these drugs. Uh, and some of these drugs uh, can give rise to cortical sinus thrombosis. Uh, cisplatin and carboplatin, not only in the veins, but also in the arteries, actually predominantly in the arteries. 
therefore good history taking is very important in such situation 85% of the times uh, patients with cortical venous thrombosis will have an identifiable risk factor as opposed to intra abdominal thrombosis in the venous study 5.2% of the patients with cortical sinus thrombosis were diagnosed to have a malignancy this is much more than what you would pick up in your standard leg or uh, pulmonary uh, embolism and uh, if the age goes above 50 this is even more statistically significant uh, the two biggest uh, uh, reasons for the thrombosis in the cortical sinus is breast cancer and hematological malignancies if you don't treat cortical vein thrombosis uh, these are the some of the issues that are going to arise in your patient therefore the diagnosis and treatment is extremely important but if treatment can be either anticoagulation thrombolysis neuro intervention or surgical intervention we'll concentrate on anticoagulation thrombolysis because this is something which physicians like us are more um, able to perform like any thrombosis first 3 months we have to give anticoagulation and apparently as far as the initial phase is concerned in hospital lmwh is the way to go um and this should be given irrespective of intracranial hemorrhage while there is no randomized control evidence for doax the doax data is improving and i'm going to show you some data on that also if you look at all the guidelines which are there uh, available to us there is no doubt that anticoagulation should be done for all patients with cvt respect of bleed start with lmwh or unfractionated heparin depend upon what is the clinical profile like renal involvement and thrombocytopenia uh, and then you can uh, go on to vka or doax these guidelines at that time were for vka doax were not known at that time and if you are giving anticoagulation just like extrapolation of data from elsewhere 3 months minimum to 6 to 12 months if there is a reason to extend it's a clinician's uh, decision and indefinite if it is recurrent or the uh, reason for thrombophilia uh, is uh, significant or persistent the type of heparin usually now we switch to low molecular weight heparin rather than unfractionated heparin and the reason is because unless there's a contraindication for lmws like renal insufficiency or you need a fast reversal of anticoagulation because you want to do surgery we have gone to lmwh this quality of evidence is low and the strength is also weak but it is extremely convenient because unfractionated heparin two issues one is to do that aptt on a regular basis to keep the aptt between 60 to 90 round the clock so you need a lab which is working round the clock and the collection should be good because variables are very important pre analytical variables and uh, second thing is that uh, 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 heparin induced thrombocytopenia is a reality which is not so with lmws to that extent thrombolysis um, there is no recommendation for thrombolysis of uh, as as of now although its quality of evidence is low and the strength of recommendation is basically inconclusive but if you do a risk assessment score and i'll show you the risk assessment score if you got a risk and the risk is less than 3 then it is unwise to expose the patient to aggressive and potentially harmful treatment such as thrombolysis so if we do a risk assessment it might be easier so if your patient is not in that risk then uh, giving a thrombolysis is of no use otherwise it might be worth considering after having a detailed discussion with the patient and the family members so if you look at the algorithm for cvt um, clinical suspicion based on whatever method you have to initiate anticoagulation if there's a neurological improvement you must continue for a longer period of time it can be vary from 3 months to 12 months depending upon the risk factor if your patient is not improving then you've got two options option one if you have talent then to do endovascular therapy uh, with thrombolysis but there was a trial called to act trial which did not show superiority at the end of one year so actually futility was shown and it was given up with high incidence of bleeding and then those patients who got who are not improving getting worse and mind you even for patients who are presumed to be dilated bilateral fixed pupils have benefited and improved after doing a, a decompressive hemicranectomy so don't give up especially if you think that the other vitals are good you can still do a surgery and still bring the patient out with a 70% recovery rate don't forget that cortical sinus thrombosis has other issues like those shown here and they should be concomitantly addressed now what about doax in unusual sites uh, these were excluded from the trials as dr radhika showed us but they have advantages as also dr radhika has shown us so let's see its use in svt and cvt evidence is limited but growing there are few randomized trials which have been completed most of them show 
that doacs are at least as effective or non inferior as vka and the bleeding risk is not higher so both the primary endpoints are met multiple trials are still accruing patients and we'll get answers as we go along but in the real world as the google chat was shown to you in the real world doacs have been used in almost in third of patients who got low bleeding risks we must say that doacs are contraindicated indicated in child for c uh, especially and rivaroxaban for b and c liver disease and for cortical sinuses you must keep in mind the interaction of doacs with the anti epileptic drugs and if there is a hemorrhage doacs may not be your choice in such a situation continue with lmwh for a little extension of time and then maybe you can switch to an appropriate agent there is good data for cortical sinus thrombosis with dabigatran it was shown that it was as good as warfarin with no increased bleeding likewise with rivaroxaban it showed that similar clinical benefit uh, with rivaroxaban as compared to vka and in a meta analysis systemic review uh, protocol which was done recently in the year uh, 2019 uh, the doac used in cortical sinus thrombosis is getting attention in the trial however due to its slow recruitment and the reason more is fear guidelines are not expected to change soon but there is a secret study going on a prospective study for dabigatran and a respect study which is uh, which is going on for uh, dabigatran all of which will throw more light on the situation so you can use in today's world warfarin for svt or doax but keep in mind the put status and for cortical sinus thrombosis dabigatran has been used 150 mg twice a day with equal benefit now coming to my i think second last point that is of doax in aps patients now we do uh, the most important test is of aps during patients who got thrombosis because it can affect your choice of anticoagulation yes doax are convenient but you have to be careful if there is an underlying apla so vka should be used in patients with apla instead of doax especially if they got triple positivity la aca and beta 2 glycoprotein if they got arterial thrombosis is they got small vessel thrombosis or organ involvement and there's a heart valve disease all as per the sydney criteria now if there's a recurrent thrombosis while on therapeutic intensity vka you still have to increase the inr from 2.5 to 3.5 rather than switching to doax in patients with apla and if those uh, if the recurrent thrombosis because of non adherence or non compliance to vka we must actually educate them to become compliant do frequent testing but we must continue to remain on vka because that is the way it is but if you got a single or a double positive apla and the patient uh, has been on doac he's got good adherence then we can tell them that look you not had a problem you can continue it but ideally as per guideline you should switch to vka but many times patients do not want an uh, alternative they saying that even if i have aps i'm doing well i've got no recurrence i want to continue the same so that time there's a discussion but you must pen down your thoughts that vk is better what's the prognosis they are generally favorable in 75% of the patients 15% unfortunately may die or be dependent on the family members uh, risk factors can be calculated for choice of treating agents and uh, despite the physical recovery many survivors have anxiety and depression and cannot return to work because of cognitive impairment and this is in 30% of patients undiagnosed uninvestigated or unrecognized and we don't uh, and we are not able to understand them and they are not as good as before recurrence of cvt is quite low 2 to 7% um, uh, for uh, recurrence of cvt and about 4 to 7% for systemic thromboembolism but if they have got a severe thrombophilic disorder or they were in a bad shape in the icu i would want to continue uh, anticoagulation on a long term basis because they are the highest risk of recurrence again you can do the risk assessment to know what's happening in covid 19 this is something which has hit us very badly this is my second last slide um, we've seen splanchnic and cortical sinus thrombosis cortical vein thrombosis in patients who have either had a natural infection to covid or had the vaccination and then had the covid especially with the uh, uh, adenovirus based uh, vaccine what is different in these and what is the difference in treatment they usually have severe thrombocytopenia which we don't see in the others it comes within 28 to 42 days after vaccination but in naturally acquired infection with a heavy load as seen much earlier they don't have conventional risk factors which predispose into thrombosis thrombosis therefore it was only the covid-19 infection or vaccine which was the reason they have more ic bleeds and have more incidences of going to coma and therefore they were higher in hospital mortality almost 50% of these patients die as opposed to those who did not have covid 
and they also got a higher rate of VTE. All these suggesting that yes, there's a mechanism of VITT like a hit syndrome, but there has to be something beyond. So well, even hit did not have so many features as has this. So I'll summarize by saying that in unusual site thrombosis, venous thrombosis has in unusual site is unique, has obscure provoking factors, and therefore individualized workup and treatment plan, especially in the young, is needed. Is diagnosis is challenging because some of them are asymptomatic and some of them have a heterogeneity in presentation. But whatever it is, immediate initiation of anticoagulation for all venous sites and including for the asymptomatic uh, is very important. These sites invite a careful search for an underlying malignancy like an MPN or an antiphosphate sy syndrome or PNH. The treatment goals include anticoagulation with parenteral heparin followed by an oral um, uh, anticoagulant, prevention of recurrence, and at the same time being safe. Intervention modalities are there, but we use it in very few patients, provided the criteria are met, including for splanchnic pain thrombosis, there is an endovascular uh, thrombolysis which can be done. Anticoagulation generally recommended for three to 12 months in these unusual sites, but uh, the length of duration will depend upon the estimated risk of recurrence and the presence of provoking factors. To start with, heparins are preferred, rather than direct oral anticoagulants or direct uh, VKAs. Most times, long-term anticoagulation would be needed due to their presentations. Direct anticoagulants are promising alternative to warfarin. We are using them, but we need more trial. Thank you very much. And I'm again, sorry for the interaction that occurred in between. Thank you, Abhay, for that wonderful uh, clarifying so many issues. So we'll go back to the question and answer session. Those of you who would like to ask questions from here, please use the raise hand sign. We have two questions in the chat box again for Dr. Uh, these are related to pulmonary embolism. The first question is that if somebody has got mitral folic acid deficiency and there is no other finding, does it impact your treatment in any way? Pulmonary thromboembolism and low mitral folic acid. Uh, so, so vitamin B12, if there's low vitamin B12, you would want to check your homocysteine levels because it can be high in this uh, in these patients. So if your homocysteine levels are high, you know that could be a risk factor for your pulmonary thromboembolism. Obviously, you would want to treat these underlying deficiencies, but you would still anyway give them anticoagulation for treatment of the pulmonary embolism. Thank you. The other question is if there is a patient who is breathless and who uh, was mainly seen by the cardiologist, and uh, 2D echo was normal, but the CT chest picked up the pulmonary thromboembolism. Will there be any difference in the treatment? Echo normal, CT thorax mm -hmm. shows the pulmonary thromboembolism. No, so, so there would be no difference in treatment here because they would still fall into the low risk PE category uh, because you know there is no evidence of right heart strain, there is no evidence of hemodynamic instability. So uh, breathlessness here in this case is probably just because of VQ mismatch. Uh, ventilation perfusion mismatch that is caused because of the thromboembolism. And that should get better with uh, with just anticoagulation treatment. Obviously, as a respiratory physician, if you know somebody remains persistently be uh, breathless despite adequate anticoagulation, you will obviously keep chron chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension at the back of your mind. But that's at least after three to six months of anticoagulation. But again, very rare to develop CTPH if your baseline echo was absolutely normal. Last question lying here is, I don't know whether you handle pediatric patients or not, because the question is related to what is the preferred anticoagulants in pediatrics? Uh, so, sorry, so I don't handle pediatric patients, so I don't want to uh, comment on that, but I'd be more than happy if you or anybody else in the panel could take this question. How do you want to answer that? Yes, yes, Probably I'll answer the question. I prefer to use... I prefer to use low molecular heparin uh, because uh, we do not know the uh, clinical pharmacokinetics for DOAX in pediatric population. They are very limited data. However, adolescents, you can use DOAX, but if anybody is below 12 years of age, then low molecular weight heparin is a preferred drug of choice and still the standard of choice drug in these patients. Thank you. Do you monitor the doses? Uh, for low molecular weight apparent, not everybody has a factor 10A, but given the clinical safety profile, I think it's a safe drug to be which one can easily use. I have used as a, a one month age and uh, new infants also who present with uh, protein C deficiency and 
warfarin induced skin necrosis so the experience has been quite uh, happy uh, hardly we have any problems with the drug over dosages in these groups of patients so clinical safety profile with low molecular repellent is well studied and i prefer enoxaparin over delta parin dr karuna kumar yes sir we got two guests so you yes. addressing the name of your addressing the question yes sir so uh... So this question is uh, for Dr. Abhay, sir. Uh, so chronic portal vein thrombosis, uh, asymptomatic. We picked up uh, incidentally, you know. And then he, later we came to know that this patient has an uh, MPN, JAK2 positive MPN. So will you treat this patient or not? If you treat, what is the choice of uh, drug? So uh, that's and a great long... question. Yeah, that's a great question. It's uh, um, Obviously, it's hard to answer because obviously there was an event because of that MPN. MPN was undiagnosed. And then there was a thrombus. Uh, as for guidelines now, uh, they have not gone into so much detail as the question that you are asking. But if it's a chronic PVT and the patient is asymptomatic, they have said not to treat. But there is one data of rivaroxaban in chronic portal vein thrombosis. As compared to placebo, it has been shown that the recanalization is better. That's why if you've got a patient of uh, chronic PVT, with an underlying malignancy, you want to prevent an acute and chronic thrombosis, it might be worthwhile discussing with the patient, um, especially if they're symptomatic, that the treatment is needed. If they're asymptomatic, it has to be discussion between the patient and you. Either that they present to you for a repeat Doppler to see for extension, which rarely happens in our country, or to follow up if there is a symptom, and then it can be initiated. Many times because of the safety of the DOAX, and there's a beautiful paper of rivaroxaban 10 milligram twice a day, which has been shown to be effective in not only uh, recanalization, but also in terms of uh, safety, in terms of bleeding. So in our country, uh, the ability of the patient to understand the finer nuances is difficult, and therefore you might end up actually treating such patients. So technically, you must tell them the pros and cons of anticoagulation, and if there is anxiety, then giving them a low dose of anticoagulation of 10 milligram twice a day, or even for that matter, 10 milligram once a day, might prevent new clot formation. And then look at the MPN underlying, do the investigation necessary for MPN, and see whether you have to treat the MPN simultaneously to reduce the risk of thrombosis. I hope I've asked, answered your question, Dr. Yeah. Yeah. So because these, you know, being a, this kind of thrombophilic state now, Jack 2 positive being there. It's, it's so, a, yeah. ongoing. So it's a long term anticoagulation. Yeah. It'll yeah. go on. Yes. Yeah. Uh, sir, one more question, sir. Uh, how frequently do you do this uh, uh, jack tube mutation and uh, PNH workup in cases of uh, thrombosis, venous thrombosis? So in intra-abdominal, I do it for every single patient, even if the counts are normal, because you don't need in jack tube positivity for counts to be, you know, like a pancytosis. So it is done, and I'm just facing an issue just now where a young man has come to me with an intra-abdominal thrombosis, which was conservatively managed, and as part of the route, I only do three thrombophilia tests. One of them is JAK2 for unusual site, and it has come positive, and it's completely asymptomatic. But he had a thrombus in the abdomen. So now the issue is going to be, how am I going to counsel him? It's going to be really tough for me, but then it's necessary to pick it up also uh, to tell the patient so he's wise for the future. So I do it. Okay. I do PNH also. Yes. PNH also. Okay. Yes, I do. So, so one more question. Both yeah. these two, you'll you'll have a different yeah. way of looking, different discussion, and different outcomes. So PNH, sir, is there any choice of drug here, anticoagulation, like in Apla? Because the, here the PNH thrombosis, you know, slightly different here. Yeah. Yeah. A great question. Uh, I don't have a ready answer for it, but I look at the thrombocytopenia. If there's a significant thrombocytopenia, obviously you're stuck. Because in that case, uh, as low as 30,000, I've used low molecular heparin. And just like Dr. Professor Kashyap, I'm also in favor of enoxaparin. I tend to use it quite a lot because of its, uh, I, I found it rather safe. So I tend to use that initially. And once the episode of PNH has settled, maybe the platelets come up, it's better. Other, we have to counsel them about uh, ATG and also about treatment, including transplantation. If, if I'm just permitted, uh, maybe I can ask, answer something more to what Dr. Bhavya said from my own sure. experience. Sure. For the questions raised by Dr. Karuna, uh, the algorithm that we I would recommend is you have a portal vein thrombosis, decide whether it is acute or chronic beyond six months. 
Now, if it is beyond six months, the probability of a myeloproliferative disorder is high. And if you are able to prove at molecular level that it is JAK2 positive, either heterozygous for an ET or homozygous, then antiplatelet agents are the drug of choice. It's a part of treatment for PRV. It's because of the hyper aggregation of the platelets that is producing the thrombosis. So there's no role of uh, anticoagulation. But if you get an acute onset portal vein thrombosis, then there is an additional factor. So there you can be adding anticoagulant. <clears throat> if you pick up a PNH, then the treatment is look at the CBC. If the platelets are not low, then you can finally go ahead and use a DOAC. If the platelet counts are below 50,000, or if there is an associated liver dysfunction being present, then use a low molecular heparin. And I think that's a, a safer option. So PNH is a little bit a risky ball game. You will tend to land up with more bleeding episodes if you try to over anticoagulate this patient. So look at the liver function, look at the platelet count, and prefer to use a low molecular heparin. Don't use a DOAC. That's my uh, advice because I have burnt my fingers uh, using in patients with Bacchiari syndrome or PNH patients. So low molecular heparin is a drug of choice. Then you bridge with uh, warfarin, sir, later. Uh, warfarin, again, it's a very difficult. If, if I have a compliant patient, then I prefer to keep using once a day uh, low molecular heparin. And if I were to use a uh, warfarin, then yes, the bridging is there and there. But again, the as usual with INR, getting a INR, I keep it on the lower side. I don't go between 2 to five, 3. I would prefer 1.5 to 2.5. And that's safe enough. But the platelet count is the most essential point over there. 50,000 below, don't touch it. Books may say 30,000. Second is many of you, uh, my colleagues look at the clonal size of the um, PNH clone. They say that the higher the larger the clonal size, the risk of thrombosis is higher. So give them a prophylactic anticoagulation. My advice is please don't go by that. Look by the clinical evidence to say whether the patient has a thrombosis or no thrombosis. So one, one final question. That this MPN... The patient is on antiplatelets. You start anticoagulation depending on indication. Can you stop antiplatelets or you just no, concomitant, uh, both? concomitant? It can go both together. You have to keep monitoring your platelet counts at the same time. If if your platelet count falls below one lakh fifty thousand, you can stop the uh, equosprint or reduce the dose of equosprint from the standard seventy five milligram. Uh, if you look at the in vitro, the um, equosprint thirty three point five is adequate enough for producing an antiplatelet anti effect. So 75 milligram is the one I don't go for 150 wherein some some of the clinical trials would have recommended. 75 is a standard. If you feel that you're using a concomitant, make it 75 milligram alternate day or give 75 milligram half a tablet. And keep monitoring your platelet counts at that time. Look, thank you, sir. Uh, wants to say um, I don't use uh, low dose warfarin. I don't try to keep the INR below two because the data is very clear that uh, less than two INR has not helped. Uh, the incidence of thrombosis is just the same. As opposed to this, in the low dose of DOAC, uh, which uh, Dr. Adhika showed, uh, there is a uh, improvement. So if you have to use a lower dose, then DOAC in low dose would be preferable than lesser dose of warfarin. I, I don't. I must admit, I don't use antiplatelets for patients with MPN. Uh, who have got uh, uh, venous thrombosis, I tend to use anticoagulation. However, if an MPN is associated with an intra-arterial thrombosis, then antiplatelet uh, uh, would be my drug of choice. Uh, if there is both, as happens in APLA syndrome, then what do you do? So this was discussed in one of our webinars with an international speaker, and the answer was to give full-dose anticoagulation for the venous thrombosis and one antiplatelet along with uh, the anticoagulation to keep the arteries happy. So that was my take-home message from that uh, webinar. Dr. Anupama Jagya. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, so this uh, is a question for Dr. Abhay, actually. Uh, first of all, that was very nice talk. Uh, it touched upon very important issues. And just because I'm always interested to see what's happening, like what are the experiences across the continent, uh, you know, about uh, when we started with the AstraZeneca vaccination in the UK, which is equivalent to the COVID shield in India, we had a flurry of the, with the vaccine induced thrombotic thr thr uh, thrombosis with thrombocytopenia cases 
coming in. And interestingly, all our presentations were actually cortical sinus venous thrombosis. Uh, and what we used was we used a lot of intravenous immunoglobulin along with the unfractionated heparin followed with warfarin uh, to manage them. Uh, I mean, from India, if we look at actually the data, even though it's one of the largest users of Covishield, we haven't actually had these cases reported. I think there have been just one or two anecdotally reported cases. So it was very interesting because you talked about some splanchnic uh, thrombosis associated with it. So I was just keen to know your experience about yeah. this. Thank, thank you for that question, uh, Dr. Jagir. Um, I have seen uh, both with the natural infection and with uh, post-vaccination. Uh, and maybe because the awareness is high, we tend to look for the NC antibody, nucleocapsid antibody, and um, uh, the time gap between taking the vaccine and onset of symptomatology. And if it's within a 28-day uh, period or maximum up to 42, especially with the drop in fibrinogen, drop in platelet count, uh, these are candidates for vaccine-induced thrombosis. So I I've seen it. I'm not saying I've seen it in tons, but it's not that it didn't exist. Uh, we tend to see, it, given the number of patients that people we have given vaccination, the incidence is very less. No doubt about that. And thankfully for that. Uh, but for those who have, it's a high mortality. And therefore, mm -hmm. being aware is very important because like you very rightly said, treatment includes steroids, immunoglobulins, and uh, heparin uh, for these patients. And therefore, they have to be looked at differently and they have to be picked up early. The mortality is inordinately high because they, once they go into a IC bleed and coma, the chance of coming out is zero. Yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. That was... Patients were Caucasians or Asians in UK? Uh, so everything because I work in a like in London, which is heavily Asian uh, ethnic origin, you know, area. So we saw a lot of Asians as well. Interestingly, the age group was always forty uh, to fifty. That's the age group that I particularly saw, and uh, it's very interesting because we are also seeing that we have got some patients who have developed ITP post the Pfizer vaccination. And even though we don't really have that much, uh, you know, uh, scientifically collated data behind it, but we are seeing this, and they are, ha and it's been very bad, unresponsive kind of ITP that we've seen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one question lying here for Dr. Bhave is: Why does DOAC be inferior to vitamin K antagonist in APS. So I'm assuming this is not triple vessel, but triple positivity APS. Um, so I, I try to look at basic sciences to find out why is an unusual sinus thrombosis unusual? Why is it not usual? If I've got a lower limb DVT, why don't I get a DVT elsewhere also as commonly? I've not been able to get any answer from basic science research, but it appears there is some interaction uh, between the local endothelium of the vessels and an inciting factor. And since in unusual sites, the inciting factor may be different from that in the leg veins or in the lungs, our chance of developing thrombosis there is higher. For example, malignancies, myeloproliferation, PNH, and things like that. It's to do with the interaction of the local milieu interior with the uh, vessel wall. I think that's the, probably the reason. Coming to your question of why DOAX is in not e effective. See, in trials, especially the TRAPS trial, uh, it was shown clearly that when the, uh, when the APS was significantly positive, the risk of getting recurrent thrombosis was higher. So actually, the trial showed a negative value for DOAX. Now, the question is why they were recurrently more. Uh, it's hard to answer. It has to be with the inflammation that is ongoing in the APLA syndrome or probably the way the APLA uh, antibodies interact with the local vessel wall. Maybe the dose of the DOAX that we are using now in conventional form may be inadequate. And the answer might be to do a trial with a higher dose, like you do for the induction, that is 15 milligram twice a day, and then drop to 20 milligram for Evaraxaban, or 10 milligram twice a day and drop to 5 milligram twice a day of Evaraxaban. Maybe if we were to have a higher dose and continue that higher dose till that inflammation is quenched, and then maybe come down. I don't know whether the answer will be different. And there is a trial going on for that. There is uh, Dr. Daniel and Dr. Souza who are 
whose webinar was most interesting in June this year. And they are looking at DUSP, that is DOAX in unusual sites. And uh, they are trying to look at and try to accrue patients. And I'm hoping that in a year or two, ISTH might come up with more data from them. Thank you, Dr. Ashutosh. Hello, sir. Am I audible, sir? You're audible. Am I audible? You're audible. Am I? Yes, yes. Thank you, sir. So my question is, is there any long-term adverse events associated with... This is to Dr. Avai. Associated with? Use of DOAX, long-term okay. side effect. I think we've learned from Dabigatvan, which was available to us for, I think, a decade. And uh, the side effects have been very minimal in terms of bleeding. Um, so uh, my answer is long-term, 10 years at least, the use of GOAX. We've not seen any new parameters that have come up. Uh, there is no EMA uh, uh, highlight anywhere or from the American Society of Rheumatology that says that after a particular number of use, there's a problem. The problem is more with the inappropriate use of GOAX. Uh, you have to select your patient carefully. And uh, a large number of issues with dabigatran happened in its earlier form because the wrong patient was selected for that drug. And therefore, the wrong patient is the bigger reason for a side effect. In the right patient, right dose, appropriately monitored and assessed, uh, the risk of uh, DOAC causing any long-term side effect, at least for a decade, has not been significant. Sir, my another question is, I have two patients of cardiac amyloidosis. So do you recommend use of DOACs in them? And in which scenario it will be most appropriate? From which point of view would you want to anticoagulate the amyloid patient? Because uh, they have, uh, though, I uh, mean, uh, they are developing exertional dyspnea, uh, uh, intermittent palpitations, uh, edema, pedal edema is there. Uh, mostly they are restricted to bed. So that's why prophylactically, if we use uh, DOACs, is it safe or any other anticoagulation is preferred or it is not at all required? So uh, currently, to my mind, I don't think there's any prophylactic recommendation for use of DOACs in amyloid unless there was a history of thrombosis or you are going to use an IMID. If you're going to use an IMID as part of the treatment of amyloid, then the risk of thrombosis will be higher. Here, I would not prefer antiplatelet because it may be ineffective at the dose of 75 milligram what we use. You might have to use uh, a higher dose of an antiplatelet or maybe even switch. Then you look at the other uh, conventional factors for thrombosis. So is there obesity? Uh, how much is the level of immobility? Yes, then uh, like Dr. Radhika said, a lower dose might be as effective with less bleeding and you might win the game there with an IMID especially if you're going to use, say, daratumumab or cartilzomib uh, as it's going to be high risk. So maybe that's where I might recommend. Otherwise, offhand, a mobile and active patient, I can't see, but I'm open to this discussion from uh, uh, Dr. Agarwal, sir, and Professor Kashyap, if they want to tell their experience. Thank you. If it comes to cardiac amyloidosis, uh, don't look for the disease per se. You just go by the well-scoring system of probability of a thrombosis. So underlying cancer would be one factor. Score for the immobility if the patient is obese, then obviously he will be a candidate to go for a uh, prophylaxis. And as I said, I would uh, prefer a low molecular heparin, but apixaban with a safety profile uh, because these patients, it would be worthwhile. Until and unless you are planning to, the uh, patient is actively on a chemotherapy. So you can use uh, a DOAC the, safely. And surprisingly, the, the, the ability to keep to LMWH, we thought will be, it's an injectable, it may not be welcome. But when you discuss everything, they don't mind taking once a day LMWH. They are they're quite happy in the initial phase when you're assessing and treating the cardiac amyloidosis. It might be a good idea to use LMWH also. So my last question, sir, to Dr. Avoy. Go ahead, go ahead. Sir, yeah, okay. Sir, this is, uh, suppose a portal vein thrombosis, duration is more than six months, and there is a formation of uh, cavernous formation, and uh, the vein is completely obstructed. So a continuation of uh, DOACs or any anticoagulation 
uh, only to prevent or any other possibility that we can revert it uh, uh, this obstruction portal fan obstruction and portal hypertension i think dr panigrey i answered this uh, aspect with dr karuna's question and that uh, it depends upon symptom versus no symptom and what is the clinical state of the patient the persistence of um, uh, provoking factors that will help you to decide whether to give an anticoagulant maybe i okay, can just sir. add on okay, to sir. it okay. Uh, th this is a topic of interest for the interventional radiologists also. So, yes. if what you have described in a clinical scenario, uh, they would say that you could actually go and stent the patients. So, uh, where we any dedicated team of interventional radiologists, are there, we usually see patients with Bacchiari syndromes who are chronic and who have this so-called uh, organized thrombus or a portal wound, and with the uh, portal hypertension, we stent them. And then follow up them post stenting with a uh, anticoagulation with a warfarin or a DOAC or a low molecular heparin. So that's what I said. Uh, uh, unusual site thrombosis is a multidisciplinary approach. You need to have a uh, uh, interventional radiologist along tying with up and decide which will be the candidate to go in for a stenting, followed by your monitoring and anticoagulation apart from treating the underlying disease. Thank you, Dr. Kashyap. Dr. Anil. Thank you. No question. Yes, sir. Dr. Anil. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Thank you for the wonderful session, sir. I just have a uh, query. I have a case scenario about a 43-year-old female patient who presented to another hospital with severe anemia and thrombocytopenia. And the patient was managed as ITP, was given as IV methylprate, then IVIG. And then patient was not improving. So she was referred to our center again. So on the day of admission, she was fine. But the next morning, she had a seizure and uh, she went into coma. So I was consulted by the parent unit and I just uh, saw the CT. I found that there was a hemorrhage. So I immediately consulted my friend, a neuroradiologist. He said it is a hemorrhagic transformation of a possibly cortical venous thrombosis. So I was thinking there was anemia, there was a thrombocytopenia, there was a cortical venous thrombosis, and there was a presence of cystocyte in one of the CVC, about 0.04%. Uh, so I thought, why not would it be TTP? So I started immediately management of TTP. With uh, the platelet count of 7,000, we started plasma exchange, IV methylprate, rituximab, and uh, Patient was in uh, coma and we uh, do all the other uh, possible treatment. Now, day seven of plasma exchange, her platelet count started increasing slightly to around 30,000. Then by day nine, it improved to around uh, one lakh. So by day seven, we thought, why not I introduce the low molecular weight heparin because it was slightly coming up. So now patient is still in coma. Platelet has completely improved. Hemoglobin has improved. Now my uh, query and my uh, question to the house and to the Dr. Avey sir is that, how would you have approached regarding this uh, possible cortical venous thrombosis? And then how long to give this uh, anticoagulation in such a scenario? Anil, can I ask you two questions before anybody yes. else? What is your cutoff for the percentage of cystocytes to be called significant versus insignificant? So uh, we used to keep 1%, but there are many studies where the cystocytes may not be even present. Sir. So we thought, uh, could it be a rare case where the cystocytes are less? One. Number two, did your patient have evidence of microangiopathic hemolysis? Yes, sir. The reticulocyte count was very high, around uh, 10 above, and the LDS was more than uh, around 1,390 1, something, sir. There was some presence of microspherocytes. So I was in touch with my, my hematopathologist all the time. She was also very not convinced, but since the patient was not at all improving and there was a thrombosis, sir, and uh, so we treated like TTP, but Adams TS13, I could not get it, sir. More questions to you. What was haptoglobin? Uh, haptoglobin could not be done, sir. I'm sorry, sir. What was bilirubin? Bilirubin was, there was mild increase in unconsecutive bilirubin, sir. PT, APTT, KFT were all normal, sir. And what was the explanation for the microspherocytes? Microspherocytes explanation, sir, uh, was there a possibility because of some blood transfusion or was it because of the possibility of uh, part of 
this uh, TTP. This is what we, we are thinking, sir. And do you get cortical venous thrombosis in TTP? Sir, it's possible, sir. Yes, sir. But uh, because there was a hemorrhage, sir. It was a hemorrhage. And then the my neuroradiologist said it is a hemorrhage transformation, possibly due to uh, cortical venous thrombosis because uh, we have not done MR angiogram yet. So we actually do not know exactly, sir. And the cortical venous thrombosis is seen in TTP? So uh, thrombosis is possible, mm -hmm. but as such, uh, because I have not experienced it yet, sir. I must say that this is a little odd case from all the angles. Yes, sir. You've got very few cystocytes, which will yes, yes, sir. Off as normal in number. Mm -hmm. You've got cortical venous thrombosis proven or unproven, which is not a feature of TTP. And uh, unless you have microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, you know, LDH becomes a enzyme which is liberated by tissue injury as well. Mm. But the etiology of that to be microangiopathic hemolytic anemia and that to be secondary to TTP, uh, you will have to be very, very clear. Otherwise, a lot of people will get plasma exchange uh, on this suspicion. In India, uh, one agrees that availability of uh, ADMTS-13 or its antibody is a rarity. Forget just few centers in the large cities. Otherwise, that is not there. So you'll go with the clinical picture. But this is classically a microangiopathy, arterioles, venules, capillaries. It is not uh, sinus, venous sinus thrombosis. So you've got a lot of odd features. You know, one is okay, but a lot of odd features. Mm. And uh, if I'm uh, not mistaken, venography was never done, right? No, 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 sir. No, sir. Then how did they conclude this hemorrhage is secondary to the cortical venous thrombosis? That is actually the explanation of the neuroradiology friends, sir. I, because I am actually clueless. Patient was in coma. I didn't have time to wait because patient already received IVIC. Patient received steroid, everything. So thinking that uh, after referring some article that uh, microspherocytes and the cystocyte may not be always a necessity, I started plasma exchange and the platelet uh, improved uh, is expected in around day 10 and uh, fully recovered hematologically. Right now, she has a spontaneous eye opening and she is improving a little bit, but her thrombosis, uh, I wanted to repeat another CT, but because of my lack of facilities in my center, I'm not able to get all the repeat tests done, sir. Plasma pheresis was one of the treatment for ITP as well. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It was indication. We get a lot of patients who are transferred as query TTP for plasma exchange or they've undergone plasma exchange. But you know, two synacanon are thrombocytopenia and microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. So if you are not convinced about these two findings, and in this patient, I think the evidence of microangiopathic hemolytic anemia is extremely doubtful and you've got a very odd feature that major vessel thrombosis we are talking yes, about yes there will not be a scientific answer to your question and mm -hmm. i'm i'm saying all this because a lot of people are listening and uh, the diagnosis of ttp to my mind is overdiagnosed and a lot of plasma exchange are being done in patients who are not ttp at all recently we had a transfer patient from indore from bombay hospital indore who finally came out to be atypical HUS and wasn't TTP at all. And the patient had undergone, uh, patient could afford, so patient had undergone about 30 plasma exchanges. Because obviously, the patient wasn't doing that well, so it has continued and continued and continued. Uh, I would say that you should have evidence of cystocytes in good number, and it's taken as 2%, and the evidence of microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. You should use the plasma score, which is available to you in the absence of ADMTS. And if then you are convinced, then you should collect the blood before the plasma exchange to send it for ADMTS and ADMTS antibody. Start your plasma exchange and then wait for these results. Where are you sent it? Even if you have transported to another city, a very, very serious diagnosis. And you will have to also one day conclude whether to stop plasma exchange, whether to give rituximab, and how will you follow up them for lifelong? There are so many issues involved. Collecting the blood for these two tests before starting plasma exchange 
and then modifying your treatment later on, I think is very, very important. So these may be a few of the important tips for your case. Okay, I think we are running out of time, but there are one or two more questions. How do you switch from enoxaparin to rivaroxaparin? And Radhika. Uh, oh. Radhika can take it. All right. Changing from enoxaparin to, to uh, DOAC. Uh, so it depends. Uh, so yeah. So if 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 you're switching from minoxaparin to rivaroxaban, and if you've given a good dose of uh of treatment dose enoxaparin, then you can just start off with fifteen milligrams. Uh, sorry, twenty milligrams OD uh, for the rest of the duration of your treatment for uh, rivaroxaban. So I I would I would just go with I wouldn't I wouldn't give fifteen milligrams twice a day again for three weeks. I would just continue with twenty milligrams once a day. Fair enough. And then there is a case scenario. There is a case of 46 year old male, splenic vein thrombosis in CT. He presented for abdominal pain. Coagulation workup is negative. PT, PTT, inherited thrombophilia, PNH. Selected count is normal. Any role of testing for fibrinolytic pathway as the cause of thrombosis? Have it? Uh, fibrinolytic pathway, um, we actually don't have very good tests for the fibrinolytic pathway. So my answer is that uh, we won't be able to do justice to a test to see if fibrinolytic pathway is at fault. Uh, but splenic vein thrombosis is not innocuous. Uh, there is, it is also associated with uh, uh, myeloproliferative neoplasms, PNH, uh, APLA syndrome, and including with uh, a local malignancy. Uh, in fact, splenic vein thrombosis is more symptomatic in terms of gastrointestinal bleeding and development of gastroesophageal varices. And they can be actually more adding to the morbidity and mortality of the patient. So it should not be taken lightly. Look for local causes and systemic causes. And uh, more often than not, and the data is for about 35 to 50% of patients, you will get an answer uh, if you were to do uh, a battery of tests to find why there was a thrombus in the absence of trauma or in the absence of any other surgical event prior to this uh, thrombosis. Thank you. Thank you to both the speakers. <clears throat> Can I just ask Dr. Anil <laughs> one question? Uh, did he do, did he do uh, the APLA study for this patient? Um, I don't know whether he has facilities there to do APLA studies, but that's one thought. And were there any abnormal cells on the peripheral smear in addition to the anemia thrombocytopenia? Just look for other things. And now you can still do a CT venogram to see whether there was a thrombus. It will not disappear in the absence of anticoagulation. Maybe you'll get some more information now. Sir, uh, just final. Uh, this is for Agarwal, sir. A few questions, basic questions. Sir, what about the antidote availability uh, with the novel oral anticoagulants? You know? So they are very real useful drugs. And, but what about the deciding the choice based on the antidote? Suppose, say, the bleeding. So, um, available, what about availability? Available, expensive, right so we use FFPs. FFPs. Yes, that's the only thing. It's immediately and it's effective. So, we often get a reference for low protein C and S. Sir. What is the significantly low, sir? Oh, uh, more than 50% or 75% of normal? So, when, when do you call it significantly low? So, if it has been done at the time away from the acute episode, has been documented more than once, then it is significant. There is no particular cutoff, but borderline levels are not important. They do not cause clinical events. So if your lab has got a report of say 75% or 80% as the lower limit, and your patient has got 72 or 68 or 65, then to attribute the clinical event to that will be very unusual. So we go three way, one, you do this level away from the clinical episode to repeat it and show that it is uh, possible to document it twice. Three, it should not be on the transported sample. Four, the lab should be quality lab. And five, as these are genetic disorders, you may be able to document them in the family. Because these are lifelong labels, you should be as careful as hemophilia. So borderline levels, a lot of repeat studies, etc. When have you done? From where have you done? What are the clinical situation? Could you reproduce it? And what is happening to the family members? I think everything is important. All three, anti-thrombin, three, protein, C, protein. 
sir is there any condition where we routinely do family screening is there any situation like that? have you done family screening any time in your practice so for various reasons you have to do it there you know all this business goes on in academic institutions because of the cost involved in private practice cost is not an issue individual is very very important so an individual would like to know if my brother has died of say antithrombin 3 or protein c protein s i see no reason why i should not be investigated so all that uh, junk that is lying in the literature about the testing for thrombophilia i think all that is at the mass level not at an individual level and okay. the mistake not to investigate an individual level a female patients pregnancy oral contraceptive long travels there are so many important issue when it comes to individuals so be very careful when you are talking about individuals approaching to you versus a mass clinic so for final question sir so case of itp with background apla and also on thrombopoietin agonist three combination do you suggest any prophylaxis here anticoagulant or antiplatelets so depends now what is your clinical issue if antiphospholipid is the main issue causing thrombosis and as was discussed no no no, no. it's a thrombocytopenia yeah. just give a time okay. so you come across all these cases but each case differs from the other one isn't it so somebody yeah. has got a thrombotic problem as the chief problem thrombocytopenia is mild somebody has got itp is the main problem if mm. you antagon uh, ra if you are refusing to a patient this would be a very significant reason for refusing there a wonderful drug for itp your aca is 20 or beta 2 glycoprotein is 30 or your la is you know 1.5 1.6 patient has never had thrombosis and platelet is 5000 So that's the patient where itp becomes a life threatening issue and the platelet is 70000 and your aca is in 100 the patient has a thrombi here and there an anticoagulation is more important then you have those cases where you have serious problem you do not know what to do and you make errors and you make blunders uh, also the heart patient of intracranial three episodes of thrombi and platelet count is 30000 and it is refracted to your treatment now what do you do you really stuck and nobody has answers to this question you go case to case you go time to time yeah okay thank you sir uh so okay we have to come to an end it is uh, 145 uh, i have to just add few things number 1 the generics of dovex are available number 2 dovex have been approved for the pediatric and somebody put that in the chest Uh, chat box also number 3 pediatricians in india have started using them number 4 monitoring of lmw heparin is now reasonably widely available it should be used so those were few things which i thought i should mention and lastly uh, be very careful when you are anticoagulating if you are on doubtful reasons for which you are anticoagulating you can end up into hemorrhagic deaths so be be very careful that you starting point is clear cut and when you are stopping also be very clear cut because stopping can create problem you should know the end point for each thing that you do and if you don't know the end point i would say rather you refrain than to start either the end point is lifelong or the end point is clearly defined and one last uh, uh, comment is about uh, i think our friend dr rajesh mentioned that he will use both anticoagulant and aspirin uh, but in a given case of uh, myeloproliferative neoplasm you may have to dissect between the two the combination is not that safe because these are very elderly people some are 70s some are 80s and when you are giving them anticoagulation and antiplatelet agents sometimes you can end up into trouble so be very careful so those were few tips which i have learned hard way Uh, by creating mistakes and by damaging people's life so just an experience uh, in a old man okay uh, anybody wants to ask anything to each other for one or two minutes yes otherwise we close this so okay then we hand over to our sponsors for the vote of thanks are you there thank you so much thank you so much and uh, this been a great delight listening to the question answer session and uh, both these speakers sir. uh it has been always a great delight being on this platform because being the pharmaceutical uh, people we learn a lot from this forum so uh, on behalf of shilpa medical limited sir 
Uh, our vote of thanks goes to both the speaker, Dr. Abhay Bhave and Dr. Radhika Banka for delivering such a great uh, insights and all the panel members. It has been nice to see Dr. Rajesh Kashyap, Dr. Ashutosh Pani Gray from Bhuneshwar, Dr. Karuna Kumar from Hyderabad. It has been long, sir. Uh, and compliments to you for many questions, which we also got great learning. Seeing Dr. Anil Ayrom after a long time and Dr. Vikas Goyal and uh, Dr. Mahadeva Swami. So uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Agarwal, for giving us such a great opportunity of representing ourselves as an organization and uh, committing that uh, many such more events where Shilpa will definitely be a, a continuing partner. Sir. Thank you so much for the gracious uh, permission given to us to be a part of this program. Sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Srivastava, for sponsoring our academic activity on behalf of Mumbai Hematology Group. I thank everybody whom you already thanked and thanks to you and uh, Mr. Saxena. Uh, I forgot you, one more point which I'm gonna mention because it is important for the students. A PNH as the cause of thrombosis. If the CBC is normal, if the retic count is normal, if the LDH is normal, then it is very, very unlikely that this will be PNH. And if that case, the lab picks up a clone of 0.5% or 1%, uh, do not, take that as the case of PNH and start managing as PNH. As against JAK2, which should be done for all visceral thrombi as Dr. Bhave mentioned, and they have to be treated because JAK2 interacts with the endothelium and causes thrombosis. So you may have no myeloproliferative neoplasm clinically, but just presence of JAK2, again, unequivocally proven, not those question mark reports, uh, requires treatment. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. Thank you so much, sir.